In the last episode, we recounted our unlikely encounter with paleobotanists who are studying life as it was on Earth 300 million years ago, and how we helped them recover their fossil data, itself fossilized on old IBM 8-inch floppies. This collaboration was instigated by Antoine Bercovici. He is a fascinating and multi-talented character who, besides being a professional paleobotanist, shares our retro computing passion. After our collaboration, I had a chance to visit him in Paris over the New Year break. Yes, I know, that's how backed up I am producing my videos. And I thought you'd enjoy knowing him better, as well as getting a very special guided tour of the Natural History Museum in Paris. So we first made our way to the Natural History Museum, one of Antoine's favorite professional stomping grounds. The museum itself is historic as it was founded during the French Revolution in 1793 as an addition to the former royal gardens of King Louis XIII, which date back to 1635. The king's garden had something very rare at the time, a laboratory for medicinal plants, and later a zoo with exotic animals. The museum was a quite famous place for science in the 18th and 19th century, being the workplace of Georges Cuvier, considered the founding father of comparative anatomy and paleontology. Comparative anatomy, as well as paleontology, is based on the detailed scientific study of skeletons. So to do it well, it's good to have a nice collection of animal skeletons. Lots and lots of them. Well, there are about 15,000 mammal species today. And guess what? They had one of each. But of course, everyone's favorites are the fossils. We saw the big dinosaurs, but frankly, now that I had been educated about the Carboniferous, I was not so much interested in this fancy, recent, barely 60 million years old animals. I wanted to see what predated that, the reptilians, which are far older. Or this amphibian, which is from the Permian, just after the Carboniferous. Look at that. Now we're talking. This fish head from the Devonian is from our period of interest, 360 million years old. And we are working with the rarest of paleontologists, the paleobotanists, those who study ancient plants. The Carboniferous plants which data we helped recover were hidden at the back of the museum. You can recognize this magnificent fern trunk fossil which looks exactly like what we saw in the coal bowl peels. And this, my friends, is a chunk of tree number one, the first plant to develop a trunk made of wood, the first tree on Earth. It appeared during the Devonian, 360 million years ago, at the same time as our giant fish. There we go. Wood. What a great invention. We admired all kinds of weird plants. This period all ended with a mass extinction far greater than that of the dinosaurs, which is why these plants and animals look so different. Most got completely wiped out. And you remember the giant carboniferous dragonflies from the first episode? Here is the very fossil that led to their discovery. It's absolutely huge. Since the oxygen content was much higher in the carboniferous, it allowed insects, which don't have lungs and just rely on oxygen diffusion, to grow much bigger, leading to such things as three feet wide dragonflies. But it's now time to leave the family behind so we can go to Antoine's place and start talking about computer chips, of which he is an avid collector. We should, we should switch to English if I want some. Not to do some voiceover, so he's there. <laughs> well, we're going to have to speak he's, in English now if Antoine's you want to use there, this. <laughs> and uh, you see that he's an he's advanced paleontologist. <laughs> That's, uh, and I do have a lot of microchips, so which is a bit Oh, and, 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 and so there's not only real fossils, but also <laughs> some electronic fossils here. So do you use this? 
for paleontology or just for your electronic no, it hobby? Is, it is totally different. So I'm, I'm definitely an electronic hobbyist. In fact, yeah. long before I was a paleontologist, I, I made electronics. Right. And I guess I, I just carried that on. And uh, I have an interest into documenting uh, microprocessors, architectures, and silicon chips. They all have a little tag. And... So I, I scan, uh, before decapping them, I, I take photos or I scan the package so mm -hmm. I can have the exact description of the chip. So there's a little Motorola HD11 Classic, mm -hmm. a little microcontroller, and there's the silicon die from the chip that mm -hmm. I have in packed. Mm -hmm. Antoine likes to do paleontology with old chips of which he takes incredible high-resolution pictures. Intel 286, anyone? And what about this chip that powered the original Nintendo? And I'm not sure what those AMD chips are, but they sure look very pretty to me. The real fossils, and then you have the electronic fossils <laughs> laying around all over the place. Okay, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> you're good. <laughs> Dinos are presiding over all the electronics. That's what we like to see. Always a punch card laying around, though. Oh, yes, yes. You need, you need those. <laughs> that is from the CHM. All right. <laughs> Excellent. What did you bring from your collection? I brought my uh, my jewels right there. Uh, big uh, supercomputer, mainframe, multi-chip modules. These are usually very nice eye candies. Yes. Lots of silicon on there and heavy ceramic, lots of gold. Open the box. So, uh, yeah, looks precious. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, these are coming from, uh, from supercomputers from Hitachi, the MP5600 line. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you make the box? Or you come in no, that box? that's uh, that was uh, how the spare parts were shipped in that box for protection. Wow. Yeah. Can you see the the chips in there? Uh, we have to remove the heat tank, which I have not done yet. But I have other modules where you can do that. I guess all there is there is screws there that you can remove, and the entire uh, rim of it is gold plated. Wow. So this is the protective package that come with it. I'll just remove it. Where do you get those things? Well, uh, from eBay. <laughs> by really? looking yeah. really hard, by looking really hard, you can find some very very rare things. But there's the, the amazing uh, connection side with all the gold pins uh -huh. and some butt wires. Oh, no which kidding! Are, which are microscopic. Wow. I guess you don't respin that module if you make a mistake. Nope. <laughs> Un autre constructeur japonais. Mm. Hitachi. NEC. NEC. NEC with the SX supercomputer series. So this is the SX5 multi chip module right there. All oh, right. So now we're talking. Now we see the multi chips. Oh, it's on PCB. It's, 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 it's ceramic. ceramic. It's a slab. Of, it's a slab of ceramic, and all the pins. Wow. On the on the bottom side. Keeps coming. It keeps coming. And this is, this is the IBM Z series, right? This is all. All of these are Z series. This yeah. is uh, S three ninety. Yeah. So the the grandson of the three sixty. Yeah. And this is the Gen 6, I think. I have a Gen 5 and a Gen 6. So, so the S390 was a CMOS computer, at mm -hmm. least at the end of uh, its range. Mm -hmm. And they made six version of it from G1 to G6. This is at Z9, I believe. So this is probably the more recent I have. Mm -hmm. And because IBM does whatever they want, when they want to make a smaller version of this 390, mm -hmm. they make a smaller module that goes with it. So mm -hmm. there's likely the same dies, mm -hmm. but on a, on a much smaller packer. This is older? So this is older technology for IBM mainframe, the, the 9121 using uh, bipolar technology. So these are called TCM or thermal conduction modules. Yes, these and are the one I remember with, with, are, with, the, with the, little poke, the little thing that plays on top have, of them. I do 
you have the top of it, so I should okay. bring it out because it's right. pretty cool. So you do have little pogo uh, copper fingers that press on each one of those dies, but this which are spring loaded. Is, what what time is that? That should be ninety three, I would okay. say around around ninety 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 three, and uh, each of those little uh, copper plunger is uh, con contacting one of the dies. Goes on the chips there, and then you can cool it off on the other side. Mm -hmm. So. So the little anecdote is that I actually took four of these as a carry-on in my mm -hmm. handbag in the airplane. Mm -hmm. and? So and um, it was fine. Okay. Yeah, no <laughs> so uh, it didn't go through the X-rays because like a, a slab of copper is this thick is uh -huh. probably not going to show much. Uh -huh. So they were like, "This is weird." So I explained what it was that there was old computers, mm -hmm. mainframe processors, and the guy was like, oh, really? Do you have cray parts? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so he let me go back to France with my, uh, my little uh, treasures uh -huh. and heavy, uh, heavy copper heat sinks. Uh -huh. cool. <laughs> I'm going to make a modern art piece here. I guess we are. We're going to lay that out. And Oh, that's a nice one. That's uh, same thing at 390, but the multi-prize, which are the smaller scale version of the 390. So with less dies, but that's a, that's a thick module right there. Nice white alumina substrate, or whatever that is. And the capacitors are special too. Mm -hmm. uh, they are uh, manufactured for low inductance mm -hmm. because of the frequency that's in use in mm -hmm. there for the power supply. So these are called Lika caps. Mm -hmm. And there are very few uses of that outside of those I-beam modules, probably in aer aerospace, but... Mm -hmm. I've never seen these used yeah, much. Money is now blocked. So, so there is a first layer that's actually in the mm -hmm. in the film on top of it. Mm -hmm. A first layer of interconnect or mm -hmm. multiple layer of interconnect on that, and then inside the package you have yet another mm -hmm. layer of interconnect in the thickness of that. Mm -hmm. So this is why some of those modules look orange because mm -hmm. of that uh, of that film. And this is the Z9, but with all the dyes. So that's the same module. Fully populated. Oh, this one has just populated. half populated but on yes. purpose, I guess. So these chips right there, this, the rectangular one, are, are the processors, and they have two cores. Mm -hmm. But each core is working parallel for error checking. Oh. So they are not dual cores. As this is really them. redundant. They are dual core because they're redundant, and they mm -hmm. can be deactivated on the spot. Like okay. if you have a problem, a hardware problem with your cores, you can just get them out of the system. Mm -hmm. But these things have to run like uh, without any failure. Mm -hmm. That's what they're designed for. So the Z800 is, is interesting because um, it's a smaller version of the Z900, so a smaller version of that. Mm -hmm. Multi-chip module right there, and there it is. So there you have your. You you specialize in the pretty ones. Oh well, these are nice. Yeah, I I have some ugly ones as well, but I'm sh I'm not showing them to you yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. It has the golden rim, and does that recall you something that we just saw? Ah. This is the golden rim of the Hitachi, and if you look under it, it's actually made by Hitachi. Oh, that's an IBM made in Hitachi. So IBM licensed their mainframe to Hitachi for the Japanese market because the Japanese market would not buy IBM, but they would buy Hitachi. So this chip that I have in my hand right there, the Power 2 uh, from IBM, was uh, reduced to make the PowerPC 601, which was the very first PowerPC chip that was uh, used in Macs. Mm -hmm. And IBM used it as well in their RS6000 mm -hmm. line of Unix mm -hmm. workstation. Dual core dies, four of them, so eight cores, mm -hmm. 36 megs of cache, L3, so quite a lot of cache for a module of the... So those were, those were for servers at this time? These were for scientific servers or commercial servers. Mm -hmm. There's the Power 4, first dual core chip, first mm -hmm. processor to break the gigahertz barrier. Mm -hmm. I can't fit anymore in here. <laughs> Okay, we're doing 3D packaging now. Yep, uh, we're stacking them up. So we ran out of space from the table. We had to put them on the floor. The power architecture, uh, pretty much 20 year worth of IBM RISC design. It all started with the power one. So it is, uh, it is a multi-chip design. Mm -hmm. So it has a floating point unit, integer unit, uh, two caches unit, 
Uh, I think it has a load in it, and I forgot the last one. I need mm -hmm. to Google, <laughs> do my, my Wikipedia again. And it has a, a very big I.O. chip that included at the time, that was in 91, I think, that included optical links um, mm -hmm. between servers. So that yes. was pretty, pretty like fancy at the time. Power One Plus, Power One Plus Plus. So this is the original Power Two here, with the Power Two Plus. This is a Power 2 Plus as well, but in a single chip. Oh, different packaging. Different packaging of the same dies, but mm -hmm. six of them. Power 2 then got uh, made into a single chip design. This P2SC, or Power 2 uh, single chip. Mm -hmm. We do have the Power 3, Power 4. Mm -hmm. uh, this one uh, led to the G4 architecture and also... G4 as in the Apple The G5, G5. sorry, the G5, G5. architecture. Mm -hmm. As in the Apple chip, because those are the high-end workstation mm -hmm. version. Power 4 Plus, which uh, has a smaller die. And then came the Power 5, which added L3 cache, 36 mm -hmm. megabytes. The multi-chip modules with four dies and up to eight cores. And things started to get a little bit more boring, because IBM introduced the more cost-effective organic packages that we uh, probably are more familiar with Intel. And then the Power 7 and the Power 8. And Power 8 which is, is a, what, what time frame? Which is a pretty big beast. And Power 8 probably about two, three years old. So uh -huh. that's not far away. And today we uh -huh. are in the Power 9 era. All right, IBM power processor in a nutshell. And of course, it is quite important to do a rigorous comparative anatomy of this IBM chips species, so you can retrace the whole evolution from the era of tubaceous, the extinct vacuum tube-based computer life forms, through the expensivest multi-chipian era, through the modern megatransistors chipses, also in danger of mass extinction after we have reached the end of the great Moore's Lawian period. I hope you enjoyed this whirlwind eclectic tour of fossils and computer chips. There will be more of Antoine coming as he will show us how he decaps his chips. So as always, stay tuned for the next episode.